no amount of box checking will produce revival in our lives. Uh, we've got to, if possible, be mentored by someone who can locate the blockages to our sanctification. I would have to say that 80% of the men I disciple came into that relationship asking for help with the blockages to their sanctification. Mm. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry, and we've got another great episode coming up for you. Uh, Jay Wedker, he is a husband and a father. He is uh, my uh, one of my former mentors. Uh, he's still in California. I'm here in the bluegrass state of Kentucky, uh, but he's a great friend. He's been uh, very influential on in my life over the years. We've spoken before on the podcast. We're going to be talking about the Jesus movement, the Jesus revolution, that movie somewhat, but his own experience in coming to Christ in the 70s and actually within the whole uh, that atmosphere and and that culture and in Quite a few other things we'll be discussing, so it's going to be a great conversation. I hope you enjoy it. All right, Jay, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Good. Thank you, Richard. Good to see you by way of virtual reality here. Yeah, I know. It's the, the benefits of technology once again. Yes. Um, yeah, so... We've, we've talked before about worldview and other things. We're kind of honing in or, or getting down a little bit deeper onto that. Uh, why don't you just tell the audience a little bit more uh, about just your own testimony? Uh, you came to Christ in the 70s uh, in the Jesus revolution, the Jesus movement, the Jesus people. Uh, there's kind of a lot of that stuff uh, and those types of lingo. Um, just kind of give, give, give us uh, who you are and how you came to Christ and kind of your relation ship with that and Calvary Chapel and all the rest. Sure. Happy to do so. You know, that was really a unique time in, in history because uh, the East was beginning to come West with self-realization. Mm. And uh, prior to that, um, a modern modernity still held in front of us the idea that uh, through research, investigation and so on, we could find the truth and live by it. And I can remember uh, Josh McDowell, uh, the apologist, scheduled a talk at San Diego State University on whether or not the resurrection of Christ was, was actual history or a hoax. Wow. And it, it literally filled the auditorium. Wow. People still thought it was possible to find the truth, and they were interested in finding the truth. And uh, then two years later, he did a talk on uh, what God says about sex, Again, standing room only mm. in that auditorium. And so uh, that was one of the big differences between the late 60s and early 70s in our present era, because since then, postmodernism has declared war on absolute truth. Mm. In fact, we could say that postmodernism is very, very hostile to absolute truth, rejecting anything which we would describe as a totalizing worldview, a, a totalizing meta narrative, a meta narrative being a totalizing worldview that's true for everyone. Right. And so postmodernism eventually gave us not just relativism, but cultural relativism, that uh, truth is simply a perception relative to a culture and you're trapped in your culture. And so who are you to comment on someone else's truth? Right. And uh, so if Josh McDowell had scheduled either of those talks at San Diego State today, he'd be lucky to get 12 people. Mm. That's Without not... much protest, probably there'd be <laughs> lots of even, even if there were a lot of people, there'd probably be tons of protests. Right. And yelling yes. hate and this and you're intolerant, and you're a bigot and everything else. Yeah, exactly. So many things were converging in the late 60s, not only the East coming West with the Beatles and uh, other situations, but also a desire to reject the values of our parents and embrace this hippie bohemian lifestyle where I've got to be true to myself. I need self-discovery. Nothing should stand in the way of my self-expression. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in many ways, uh, not only was Eastern mysticism contributing to that, but also the drug culture and also psychology. Mm -hmm. And so, one of the things that fired the sexual revolution was not only the birth control pill that women should be able to have the same experimentations without the consequences as men, 
But another thing that fired the sexual revolution was uh, two sets of researchers, um, Kinsey and Masters and Johnson. And so both of these researchers were saying that human sexual activity is a matter of mental and physical health. And mm. so they divorced it from morality. And so, uh, and now picture the hippie movement saying, well, let's find ourselves, discover ourselves, throw off everything, including our clothes, and uh, we will somehow find ourselves. This is part of self-realization. Mm -hmm. I can remember attending sensitivity meetings uh, where people just got together to uh, be real and then uh, try to form close relationships based upon just spilling your guts. Mm. And more often than not, those things turned into uh, people just running off and having immorality. So at that particular time in history, the late 60s, um, I was on the beach quite a bit, working out, um, sustaining my lifestyle as a waiter manager in a restaurant. And uh, at that particular time, I also would visit Calvary Chapel and listen to Chuck Smith from time to time. Mm. And sometimes I would go to the miracle service <laughs> led by Lonnie Frisbee, which also took place on the same campus. Mm. And uh, at that particular event led by Lonnie Frisbee is a much smaller auditorium. And uh, you expected to hear about healings and people standing up and waving their hands, saying they're healed and and then there was a service afterwards on how to become, uh, how to speak in tongues. And they would, right. uh, anybody that came forward, they would sort of jumpstart you by having you say, la, 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 da, da, da. And then hopefully that would uh, trigger the tongues. Mm. And so uh, I, one of the things that really stood out in that time frame is uh, an epistemology of experience, that things were validated by experience. Mm. And um, I was attending Long Beach State University and uh, almost every day there was some type of protest and demonstration against uh, Nepal and Vietnam, against uh, certain conservative hawks who were senators and so on, demonstrations uh, in favor of drugs. In hmm. fact, uh, it's shocking. The school administration invited Timothy Leary to speak to the students, and he was commending taking drugs in order to uh, tune in and then drop out of culture and then wow. tune in to oneself. I, tell, I tell the audience who, who Timothy Leary is. I'm not sure who that is. Uh, Timothy Leary was, was one of the main philosophies of the hippie movement. Philosophers oh, of the hippie okay. movement. Very educated man who was a gotcha. proponent uh, of psychedelics, a proponent oh, okay. of psychedelic drugs. Gotcha. So think of some of the things that were converging here, Richard. Not only did you have the Cold War and uh, Vietnam War, but also... Uh, it just seemed like these rock stars, uh, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, Jefferson Airplane, each one of these groups was generating a new hit every few days. Mm. And so this whole hippie movement had the music to go with it. The music helped fire the philosophy. Interesting. And, uh, so, and so these folks who were drafted to go to Vietnam, they brought that music with them. And it's such a strange juxtapos juxtaposition to be around so much death and at the same time be listening to uh, the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. And yet uh, that was a common experience over there. So in my personal situation, I was unsaved, living a very pagan lifestyle. I'd experimented with uh, being a member of a fraternity when I was at the university. And uh, all they really did was uh, have parties and uh, boast about their athleticism. Most of the men in this fraternity were varsity football players at this university. I was one of the smaller men, even at six feet. And mm. so, uh, but our dues went to one main thing and that was to buy kegs for parties. <laughs> and so- uh, A worthy cause. <laughs> I, I finally left that fraternity and uh, the Lord brought some difficulty into my life uh, I had a, an unhealthy lifestyle of working at this restaurant and, and drinking and not really going to sleep until 2 a.m. Mm. And so I began to get uh, chronic tonsillitis. And then uh, my girlfriend was raped at gunpoint. And mm. then, I was, then I was drafted to go to Vietnam. And so all these things happened at once. The Lord was using that to shake me up. And uh, I remember uh, I really wanted to know the answers to these things. 
but I didn't want to abandon my lifestyle. And so uh, I brought my girlfriend to Laguna Beach one afternoon and uh, we're sitting on the blanket and someone came down with a spear for spear fishing. And he had the, uh, the rubber tubing next to it that you can pull the spear back and actually use your hand grip to make the spear fire with the rubber tubing. Hmm. It's no, there's no mechanics at all. Your, your hand you know, holds the rubber tubing back and then you can let the spear go. So I asked him to demonstrate it for my girlfriend. And uh, so he said, oh, yeah, well, I'll shoot at this sand dune and watch how the spear flies. And so he uh, showed how it was done. And uh, I said, well, that's really great. He goes, yeah, I just happen to be down here. He says, I live across the street. And anytime I want, I can pretty much go down here and get a lobster for, for the evening. That's how mm-hmm. many are around this rock. <laughs> and he, he said, I'm a pastor. And I always bring my Bible wherever I go. Now, the sun was down now. It was, was dusk. And I said to him, well, I've got a Bible on the towel here. He goes, what? I said, yeah, I've got a Bible on the towel here. And so I handed it to him and he began to uh, share with us uh, what it means to know Christ and mm. uh, really significant situation that uh, I just happened to have my Bible with me, totally unsaved. And yeah. uh, he, he began sharing the gospel. So it seemed like everywhere I went, I'd run into someone who wanted to share the gospel with me in front of mm. grocery stores, uh, no matter where I was. Wow. And so I decided that, uh, and I, I broke up with this girlfriend because she began to be utterly committed to the Baha'i movement, something she'd learned while she was in Hawaii. She came back from Hawaii and was committed to the Baha'i movement. And uh, mm. even experiencing that awful rape did not uh, change her faith in Baha'u'llah, the, uh, supposedly the prophet of the Baha'i movement. Mm. So I really wanted to know where I stood with God. And so I began to read the Bible more often, but I didn't change my lifestyle of sin. And so uh, as it turned out, I heard that uh, the gentleman who had developed all of the supplements and vitamins and nutrients for the European health spas was a new Christian. Somehow I found that out. And so I asked a friend of mine, can you get me an appointment with that guy? Can you possibly get me an appointment with that guy? Because I want to work in the nutritional division. I'm, and by the way, I changed jobs. I was a weightlifting instructor for Jack LaLanne gyms at that time. So, oh, Jack LaLanne, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to get out of the instructor business oh. and into the uh, nutrition business because that's really where my heart was. And so mm. uh, months went by, no appointment. And finally, my friend said, hey, I have an appointment with you. Uh, Friday night, 9 o'clock, be at the uh, Jack LaLanne's in Long Beach. And so uh, <laughs> I, I showed up there and uh, he interviewed me and said, uh, we'd love to have you in our nutritional division. Uh, show up Monday morning in Manhattan Beach for training and uh, we'll get you started. Mm. And I said, great. And so as we're leaving the gym, I noticed he was walking to a Volkswagen bus and I was walking to my Volkswagen bus. And so I yelled out, hey, we both drive Volkswagen buses. Aren't they great? Oh, man, they're terrific. Camp in them. Great mileage. And he's just about to open the door of his bus. And I said, I heard you're a Christian. So am I. And he just stopped him in his tracks. And he closed the door of his car, came over to me and he goes, hey, totally off the records. This has nothing to do with your job. Can we talk a minute? And so uh, I sat in the driver's seat. He sat in the passenger seat of my Volkswagen bus. And he said, "Uh, how long have you been in this lifestyle of immorality? And Mm -hmm. I just totally froze me. I thought, I don't know, maybe four or five years. He goes, well, I was in that lifestyle for 20 years. And he says, I can tell you, if you don't repent and give your life to Christ, you're going to have hell on earth and then hell afterwards. See you Monday. (laughs) (laughs) So that was the conversation. That's, that's great. Wow. And so uh, I, did he not know, like he, I mean, he, he didn't, you didn't tell him much, right? He just knew that you were just, you were living an immoral life. He just knew. Yeah. Well. He basically said, uh, you didn't miss a single inch of a single leotard that walked by the whole time you were at the gym. Uh, yeah. So, okay. uh, he figured it out from that. Yeah. Wow. All right. Long story short. Um, he finally did get me a job in the Bay area. What would become, what would become Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I moved up there. And uh, to his credit, uh, every week 
he would take a PSA jet. This is prior to Southwest. He'd take a PSA jet and fly up there and disciple me and also train me in wow. the business of selling nutrition and, and dietitian doing the nutritional work. So, wow. wow. Uh, Praise God. Anyway, I was still not saved. And so uh, one time he was discipling me and he said, well, have you messed up, gone partying, this or that and the other? I go, no. He goes, well, I thought you'd, been, you thought you'd fall on your face by now. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't really the best thing to say to a supposedly a new convert. And so uh, <clears throat> it was a very difficult job because as a single guy with, with plenty of hormones, I had to counsel new members who were women all day long. And mm -hmm. so they would sit there in their leotards and I would disciple, I would not disciple them, but I would, I would counsel them in, in, in reaching their goals through, through nutrition. And, uh, I had one weekend where I went back into a party situation and fell on my face morally. And, uh, I can remember at the end of that weekend, I went to a carnival and I was on the Ferris wheel. And every time the Ferris wheel went to the very top, I could see that four cables were holding this up. And I said, Lord, if one of those cables broke, I am utterly convinced I would fall into hell with nothing to slow my descent. Almost like the sermon by Jonathan Edwards, mm. a falling stone will not be stopped by a single, by a you know, strand of spider web. And, and I just was terrified. And so I went back to my brand new condominium and I got in the closet and I said, Lord, no one has had more opportunities than I have raised in a Baptist home, totally involved in a Baptist church, all the activities, camps, retreats, prayer meetings. And I wasted every opportunity. Would you have any mercy left for someone like me who's thrown it all away? If not, I understand, but if you do have it, I will gladly take it. That was my prayer of repentance. Mm. And um, I came out of that closet and a, a different man and uh, I immediately opened the Bible and all the truths are just jumping off the page, making complete sense to me. Mm. And uh, I just began sharing the gospel with anybody who would listen, amazed at my for amazed he had forgiven me. And uh, this same gentleman who gave me the job and used to fly up there once a week, uh, he had a home in the mountains in San Diego, up in the pine trees. And so any chance I would get, I would drive the seven hours from the Bay Area down to San Diego and spend some time with him. And uh, one afternoon, we're hiking up a peak where there was a fire lookout tower at the top. And uh, it was a 360 degree view of all the forests around mm -hmm. there. Wow. And we're sitting on a big rock. And he said, uh, you know, no one I'm discipling and no one I've led to Christ loves the Bible as much as you do. You really ought to consider going to Bible college. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I said, really? Yes, and there's only one. There's only one Bible college you should go to, and that's the one where the creation scientists are teaching. And so, Dr. Bliss, Dr. Gish, Dr. Morris, Dr. Parker, all these creation scientists were there as instructors, and also Institute of Creation Research shared the same campus. And so, uh, I moved down to San Diego, got off the beach, got away from that whole lifestyle, that whole beach lifestyle and pursued a degree in Bible. And uh, the Lord, what, really school, used... what school is that? Well, it later became San Diego Christian college at the time. It was founded by, it was founded by Tim LaHaye and it was called Christian heritage college. Okay. So my first main assignment after that was uh, in new England a church in Massachusetts uh, paid for me to come back and bring me on staff as a teacher and developer of curriculum and really as, as a part-time staff pastor as well. And so uh, that was a, a great experience. Wow. Uh, they said, they said, uh, there's a lot of opportunities back here. We're going to have you teaching in uh, two or three prisons as mm -hmm. well as writing curriculum, as well as uh, teaching in the Lagos Institute. So, I was put to work pretty quickly after Bible college. Yeah. Well, I think your questions, Richard, are more about what was it like culturally at that time? Um, are you going to steer my conversation in that direction or? Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, 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 uh, I mean, it's, I love hearing testimonies. It's, yeah. I, I, 
I think a lot of people do. You really just see God's grace, just kind of the rear view mirror sort of look back at Providence and just how things, how things work. Um, yeah. And I, yeah. oh, here's, here, here's an interesting uh, detail I forgot to add. I'd only been saved two weeks. This is in the Palo Alto Mountain View, San Jose, Silicon Valley area of Northern mm -hmm. California, basically called the Bay Area. And uh, so I'm working long hours at this gym doing nutritional counseling uh, six days a week. I only had one day off and that was Sunday. And so I would go up and uh, hike in the redwoods and read then read my Bible. Mm. And I hadn't even looked for a church home yet. And so uh, I was up there reading my Bible one afternoon in the redwoods and a young woman uh, was walking her bicycle toward me. And she said, do you have any water to drink? And so she says, I was separated from my bicycle group. Can you give me some water? So I gave her some water and she goes, I hate to ask you this, but uh, is there any way you could put your bike, put my bike in your van and, and drop me home at, in Menlo Park down the mountain from the Redwoods here? So I agreed to do that. And I noticed she had little cross earrings in her pierced ears. And I was going to ask her if she was a Christian, but she asked me first. And, uh, and then she says, well, where's your church home? I said, oh, oh, well, I'm, I'm working, you know, six days a week, long, long hours. And so I just read my Bible on Sunday. She, oh, you need, you need a church. Mm. You got to come here, Ray Stedman. You got to come to, you got to come to uh, Peninsula Bible Church in Palo Alto. So, okay, well, give me the address. You know, you got to come tonight. You've got to come tonight. <laughs> and so uh, I dropped her off and she got that promise out of me that I was going to come that night. That's great. And so I did come and uh, I was sitting in the second row. And uh, the speaker that night was Corey Tenboom. Oh wow! <laughs> so uh, yeah, and then a uh, fairly, as a fairly powerful testimony. In her yeah, story. and then as it happened, and everything uh, else. the the best expositor in the entire Bay Area was this particular pastor. Hmm. So uh, it was just the Lord's hand upon me to put me in that local church. Yeah, Ray, Ste Ray Stedman is just a phenomenal preacher and teacher. Yeah, I've heard of him. And wow. uh, so right about that time, two different major pastors had written books on body life. One of them was Ray Stedman and one of them was John MacArthur. Mm. So this whole idea that church, rather than just putting the uh, name of the sermon on the sign to make sure the grass is mowed and the church is painted white and the parking lots uh, clean, you know, if you build it, they will come. Everything was changing. Mm. It was almost like we're not going to settle for spectator values we really want true community and so uh just marvelous macarthur used to say at that time the, the, the church was only 450 people and uh, i was attending that particular church with john macarthur as pastor and he used to say we're a church of 450 ministers mm. and so he just taught for week after week on what body life really was that was later on when you were back in because he's in la Yes. And so I had moved from the Bay Area back to L.A. Uh, and then to San Diego to go to Bible college. And so this right. I'm sorry about the time frame. I graduated from Bible college in 1976, took that assignment in 77. But I was attending Grace Community Church in 73. So gotcha. OK. And the then time. I guess Palo Alto before that, because you were up there working. Correct. Yeah, I should have given you the the, the time. No, that's okay. to each of that. that's good. Yeah. No, I mean that's again that's so that's so helpful because I I think it's helpful for a lot of people. Like I said, just hearing it and really understanding. One thing that I'm getting from from you know 50 years later, 40, 50 years later, from then to now, is there's more of an openness. Uh, I think there's a lot we're seeing uh, with community and people really you know, starting classical schools or homeschooling or really, you know, COVID, of course, and, and kind of eye opening for a lot of people and going to churches where no, we're going to we're my pastor actually took a stand and we're meeting regardless or, OK, we'll meet outside, but we're not going to, you know, hide or we're not going to do this or we're not going to do that. And so there's been a lot of shuffling the last couple of years. Um, but one thing that I've noticed more so than in, in recent years is the desire for deeper community, not a forced community, not a forced kind of um, familiarity, but like an actual see people throughout the week, 
you know, and we see that, I see that more here in a smaller church in the middle of Kentucky here, but I think I, that's kind of more, um, than it used to be, I guess. And it sounds like that's kind of similar parallels, uh, to, to the sixties and seventies, uh, to today. That's, as well. Yeah, that's true. In fact, uh, in trying to figure out why the proceeds, why the profits coming in from this movie, the Jesus revolution have doubled the predictions mm. uh, of what it would generate. Uh, I'm convinced that, uh, the mind numbing online social networks that people are addicted to, uh, have left them craving for some semblance of community. Yeah. And this, this movie is about community, even though it has its, uh, heretical moments doctrinally, it, it is about community and people are craving that community. And that's the, the, the producers of this movie really tap into the emotion in uh, showing how community is fulfilled in this movie. Yeah. Why don't you talk a little bit about the movie? I know uh, I haven't seen it yet. I plan to, I know you've already seen it and you said you took a bunch of notes. Um, give us kind of just your thoughts. What, should we see it? Should we not? What were some pros and cons? You said some heretical moments. Um, what, it, what's your, kind of elevator pitch, if you will, uh, or five minute bus ride. Hey, I saw this movie. What do you got? All right. Well, it's, it's billed as a documentary, a docudrama on the origins of Calvary Chapel mm -hmm. through Chuck Smith, Lonnie Frisbee, and then ultimately, uh, the Calvary Chapel movement and the Inland Empire through Greg Laurie. And so these three individuals are featured by the actors throughout this movie. Um, I, I was quite critical of the movie. I believe that, uh, it played on the emotions through a romance. Uh, there's a romance that, uh, draws you in just as strongly as any Hallmark movie would until, uh, they're, they're wringing tears out of you, uh, in this romance. We've got a very frustrated male who is weak, not sure of his faith, doesn't want to be disappointed. And then a very lovely, uh, active woman who, uh, is trying to get him into the waters of baptism, trying to get him into church, trying to get him to uh, commit to ministry. Uh, and then finally she kisses him first. I mean, it's just, it's like a hallmark version of conversion in some ways with this romance, <laughs> yeah. with this inner twisting of a romance all through it. And so it leaves the viewer a little bit confused about where his emotions are coming from. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of recklessness in terms of, of spiritual vocabulary uh, the whole idea almost looks like it's teaching baptismal regeneration. Mm. In fact, these there's there's several accounts where someone is a Jesus people. He wants to be part of the Jesus people movement. And uh, if he just is willing to go down to Pirate's Cove and Corona del Mar and be baptized in the ocean, then uh, he will come to know the Lord, have his sins cleansed away. And so mm. it really looks like baptismal regeneration. There's really nothing on the substitutionary work of Christ and uh, the necessity of true repentance. In fact, uh, the emphasis seems to be uh, that this movement is, is a genuine community and it is a thing. This, this is a thing. It's a movement. You're going to be converted mm -hmm. to a movement rather than to the Lord of the universe. Mm -hmm. And uh, that seems to be taught. Um, I had some other problems with it. Um, I think, it made Lonnie Frisbee look too much like a saint um, mm -hmm. when actually he was involved in sexual immorality many times during his marriage. And even evening, even nights before he would preach, he was involved in sexual immorality and homosexuality wow. and he did die of AIDS. Oh, wow. And, uh, and so I actually, used to attend that Calvary Chapel for a few months. I would hear Chuck Smith teach, and then I would go to the miracle service led by Lonnie Frisbee. And so I've seen all this up close mm -hmm. as a 24-year-old man. Um, so that was a little bit troublesome, I think. Was it similar to, I mean, obviously it's a movie, but were, were, were there things you were like watching the movie and you're like, yeah, that, that definitely is there, or, you know, I mean, obviously not going to get in too deep within a movie, but are there a lot of similarities or was it just kind of typical Hollywood kind of fiction? Yeah, I think the area where it might have been, I think the area where it was probably somewhat faithful to real history 
was that Chuck was a systematic teacher, book by book, chapter by chapter of scripture. And Lonnie Frisbee took more of the Pentecostal charismatic end of things where he wanted to uh, somehow discern the mind of the spirit, decide who out in the audience needed a particular part of their body healed. And so uh, mm. his, <clears throat> his version, in fact, was criticized by Chuck Smith as too many theatrics, too much of a circus, too much of a hmm. charismatic circus. And so people would come to that because they wanted to see the spirit do something. They wanted to also learn how to speak in tongues. And so Lonnie Frisbee's group would uh, ask people to come forward at the end and then uh, try to help them start speaking in tongues. And so in many ways, um, that really tapped into the experientialism and subjectivism uh, of that particular era, as well as the subjectivism of uh, of that brand of Pentecostalism. Mm -hmm. And was it, because this kind of sounds like, I mean, you watch the trailer, obviously you've seen the movie, but, um, you know, struggling church, dying church, older church, and, uh, you know, the Kelsey Grammer who plays Chuck Smith, um, you know, all these hippies, you know, it's the sixties and you know, cranky, cranky fundamentalists. And there's these dumb hippies and blah, 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 you know, they're dirty and whatever. And uh, it seems like they're one and the same. Although you're saying, I mean, obviously it's still, he still preached and did other stuff. Frisbee did, uh, which is the Jonathan Rumi character guy, that Jesus, the guy who plays Jesus and chosen. But was there more friction in real life or was it, I mean, is it, I mean, obviously you weren't like there for the whole time or anything, but because um, it sounds like, you know, there was one philosophy of ministry and there's another. Did Chuck Smith, I mean, I know Calvary's generally, Calvary chapels are generally still verse by verse or at least, you know, section by section, right? I mean, that's generally, they still do expository preaching most of the time. Is that right? As far as I know, uh, yeah. Chuck Smith set the mold for that. Um I, I Did think compromise, uh, I guess, or I guess that's what I'm kind of trying to get at. Well, I have no idea <clears throat> how he got along with Lonnie Frisbee for anything I experienced in attending those two churches. Hmm. Um, and I personally think it was a bit melodramatic to say that these un these great unwashed hippies need a bath and no one, they can't be saved. I think that was just for effect. I gotcha. think that was probably to try to pull in unbelievers into the movie um, to make Christians look narrow and, and bigoted. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine Chuck Smith ever having a period in his life where he would treat anybody that way. Yeah. I think that was fictitious. Gotcha. Okay. Would you recommend seeing the movie or no? Doesn't sound like it. Uh, <laughs> here's a couple of reasons why I would say save your money. Um, if you go in there with a very discerning spirit, uh, I think a man in ministry or someone who's mature enough spiritually could study that movie and in many ways see how a great falling away is actually happening right now in, in, in evangelicalism. Mm. A great falling away. And, and part of it is because the attraction model of these seeker churches that reject sovereign grace and reform soteriology are teaching decisional regeneration. In fact, um, Greg Laurie has sometimes spoken to thousands. And at the end of the sermon, he will say, I want you to pray this prayer after me. And then he has people repeat the prayer. And he says, if you prayed this, welcome to God's family. Mm -hmm. He just he just pronounced twenty five hundred people regenerated because they prayed a prayer. Mm -hmm. And as my friend uh, says in Mesa, Arizona, um, this error is as grievous as baptismal regen regeneration. That somehow you can regenerate yourself. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a huge deception. And so uh, I, I, I have a problem with that because the movie seems to underscore that. And uh, Greg Laurie has not changed his opinion of that. Hmm. Also, I've got a real problem with uh, Jonathan Rumi, who plays Christ in The Chosen, and who plays, who plays Lonnie in this particular movie. 
Uh, he is a very devout Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, the greatest experience of his life, he said, was uh, was face to face meeting the Pope and then uh, climbing the stairs in the Vatican on his knees. And uh, in order for Jonathan Rumi to uh, play the part of Lonnie Frisbee accurately, he went to Lonnie Frisbee's grave and laid on the grave trying to contact his dead spirit, which he said he did contact in order to. <clears throat> wow. So uh, the fact that he is wow. a Roman Catholic who has leanings toward necromancy is, is very disturbing to me. Yeah. And, uh, so I think collectively there's quite a few reasons to not see the movie. I think you could see it for reasons of discernment, mm -hmm. but if you want to be carried along by its emotion, I would say be very careful. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's helpful. I hope those, I, I, I hope people find that helpful too. Um, Cause yeah, I mean like any other movie, right. You're going to have fictional stuff. That's, you know, either good, bad or otherwise. Uh, it sounds like more, more otherwise or bad. Um, <sighs> revival is something obviously that was, you know, a revival and, you know, time will tell and, and, you know, eternity mm -hmm. and even decades later, uh, whether or not people are really coming to faith in Christ and really having lives changed and everything else. And we've seen this many, many places. And I, I've heard of it, especially here. I've lived here in Kentucky almost 10 years now uh, and in where we're pastoring for the last couple and a uh, smaller area and all that. But I'll hear it often. You know, and I heard it in California when we were there in Burbank going to a solid church and pray, oh, we got to, America, wow, we need revival. We just, I just, we just need revival. I just wish we really need to, what the Lord should bring revival. I wish he would bring revival. You know, so there's, there's, there's a desire. We know that. Um, but we don't really know what it looks like, which will, I think we'll kind of wrap up with here shortly. But Asbury, that's all the rage. I'm hoping to talk to a guy, um, pastor friend who went. Uh, and I know another guy who actually is a student at Asbury. I don't know know him well, but uh, it's 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 all the it's all the rage, and and you know the media is talking about it, everything else. What are your thoughts on Asbury? Um, I have some of mine, and I'll, I'll keep them uh, if I need to. But what what are your thoughts on it, and kind of what you've seen in the past, and even the Jesus movement of the seventies? and other things that have cropped up over there. Because I think some of it, just to all preface, I think sometimes, you know, we're very much like by the book, which can be very narrow in a bad way, right? Obviously Christ is the only way, not that narrow, but like this, the point of, well, I don't think it would be like that, you know? <laughs> and it's just like, well, do you, have you read church history? You know, <laughs> have you paid attention to the new Testament? And so clearly things happen and people, you know, they're not all exactly the same. We're not all the same. So we sometimes, I think, some we'll see revival and think, or something happen unusual. And we're like, ah, that's not right. You know, and then other people will just swallow everything hook, line, and sinker. Uh, what are your personal thoughts on it? What have you seen and kind of compared to the 70s and, and other revivals that you've you've heard about and seen? Yeah, I, I, I'm a big fan of uh, <clears throat> the book by Jonathan Edwards, the Religious Affections. Mm -hmm. Have you read that book, Richard? Maybe. I don't remember. <laughs> I think I might have had to read it in seminary. I did read some Edwards. I don't know. All right. Well, it is, his, it is his magnum opus. It is his magnum opus. I mean, the, the greatest book he wrote in philosophy is called The Freedom of the Will. It's not really about free will. It's about moral free agency. Mm -hmm. But uh, the greatest book he wrote about Christianity was The Religious Affections. And one of the reasons he wrote that book was to provide a rubric, a metric, a standard to decide if real conversions came out of the first great awakening. Mm -hmm. And so that book was actually used to provide discernment for that. Um, and it's been said that in the first and second great awakening, the preachers that God really used often had a three point outline, all beginning with the letter R ruined by the fall, redemption through Christ, regeneration by the spirit. Mm. And so uh, their sermons contained those three elements. Um, I have a few quarrels with the Asbury revival. Yes, 
we ought to want to experience God. Yes, we ought to have a hunger to be involved in corporate worship. And yes, um, there is a longing that seems to be there. But my problem with the Asbury revival is the testimony, almost every single testimony was about some type of deliverance from trauma, from oppression, hmm. and from um, something that had bound them and, and left them short of freedom. Hmm. And uh, I didn't really see in any of the testimonies a, a joy in being delivered from the penalty and power of personal sin. Those three Ps I never heard that Christ delivers from the penalty and the power of personal sin. Hmm. And when that's absent, that's a real warning, I think. Yeah. Um, another thing, because they basically said that scoffers and scorners and people that were unethical and demons, <clears throat> all these individuals had produced certain trauma, uh, oppression in their lives, and they wanted to be delivered from it. And uh, I think the subtle thing about that is it's very easy to defer responsibility to those who've oppressed yeah. you. That That's becomes a, almost a byline in a victim culture. So rather than saying, wow, I need deliverance from myself, my depravity, my habitual sin, mm. my servitude to sin and Satan and the flesh, I need deliverance from that. And only Christ can provide it. And he, his blood alone can do that. Didn't hear that. Mm. There's always deliverance from oppression. In my mind, that is a deferring of responsibility to the oppressor. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely noticed that a lot. And I try not to, but it just, you know, like we see it all the time of just, yeah, this, this victim type mentality, uh, whether it's, whether it's church stuff, me too, uh, or the SBC stuff, the, accusatory of these things or black versus white or any of these other issues uh, that have really been pronounced the last few years, that there's very little personal responsibility for any given thing, whether it's abject sin, you know, I'm a wicked sinner and I, I, I deserve death and praise God for his goodness, right? Like that's something, but even just a general, like, yeah, I messed up. Yeah. I took out too much college, college loans. Yeah. I, I, I did this, I did this and whatever. There's almost no, and that, at least that's not the theme of most people, whether it's a news story or a YouTube video or any other article or something like that. It's always just this oppressor, this other thing. You're right. There's this outside something, you know, the devil made me do it is kind of the new thing. Uh, it's the new devil made me do it <laughs> versus no, I made me do it. I, I did it. I sinned. I, I disobeyed. I screwed up. So, um, yeah, I've heard, I've not really paid too much attention. I've heard several different people talk about it in different capacities. Had an interesting conversation a couple weeks ago to our men's fellowship. Um, guy came and joined us and he's a regular there. And he's like, oh, yeah, it's happening. It's happening. And this and this. And he op we open up the door for a lot of other stuff. And he had some interesting beliefs. We'll just leave it at that. But of course, claim to be a believer and, you know, sees revival and thinks automatically, yes. You know, this, this little dangling thing on the fish yeah. hook, that's a worm. I'm going to eat it. And it's like, yeah. I hope it is. I really do. You know, do we need to make a definitive, this is heresy? I right. don't think so. But at the same time, I'm not willing to say, yeah, oh, yeah. Look at this. Look at all these great things. Like, what? They're just, I I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. So I, I, I hope and pray that it's it's genuine and people are really changed and really walking with the Lord, uh, afterward, especially. So, um, I guess really just lastly, because we talk about revival all the time, especially I think Midwest, South, things like that to very, you know, we want, I mean, there's little plywood pieces that are painted white with handwritten, you know, from 25 years ago, handwritten revival tonight, you know, and, and, uh, you know, we're not scheduling the Holy spirit and there's different views on revival and whatever, Okay, fine. We, if you want to just call it a night, but it's a it's, it's a night, but it's a revival. Uh, okay, whatever. Um, is it really a revival? Okay, probably not. But what 
what do you say? I mean, you're, you're great in mentoring. Um, obviously you've mentored me off and on over the years from afar and, and near and many other men and, um, walk with the Lord for so long and just I mean, your pastor, teacher, seminary trained, um, very vast experience. What do you see and want to just kind of give us as closing pr- some practical things for personal revival? I know the Holy Spirit, but you know, we can call for it and we can yield to him, you know, don't quench the spirit. There's these things. What should we do? I mean, just give us some real practical, um, revival type things as it were for our own personal lives, men and women seeking to walk with the Lord. Yeah. It'd be great if uh, we could say, here's the four steps of revival and you can implement these tomorrow. Um, I think a lot of this Richard goes back to what our first love is. A lot of this goes back to, to, to what Randy Alcorn refers to as the treasure principle. Mm. Um, no amount of box checking will produce revival in our lives. Uh, We've got to, if possible, be mentored by someone who can locate the blockages to our sanctification. I would have to say that 80% of the men I disciple came into that relationship asking for help with the blockages to their sanctification. Mm. And so we, we deal with that first and then really begin to <clears throat> show them what it means to pant after God. Are you desiring to know him? Uh, what would that look like if you begin to order your life so that you're seeking the face of God, seeking to know him, mm. seeking to care for and carefully maintain the relationship he gave to you at the moment of salvation? What would that look like? <clears throat> How would you root out and crush and trample the idols that you've decided to live with and coexist with? What would that look like? And then uh, I always recommend keep at least one book on your nightstand about the person of Christ. Um, There are so many great ones. Be constantly feeding on who Christ is and who God is toward us in Christ. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's just a wonderful book called The Person of Christ by A.A. Bonar. Just an amazing book. It's only uh, 150 pages or so. It's, it's a life changer. And then I would also say, uh, seek out Puritan works about the Christian life. Um, Jeremiah Burroughs, anything Jeremiah Burroughs writes is, is phenomenal. Mm. Yeah, he's good. Yeah. yeah. So I would say start there and then make sure your prayer life is not just your shopping list, but make sure your prayer life is is seeking the face of God. Lord, show me what is standing in the way of truly drawing close to you, drawing near, having you as my first love. Ask God to examine you. Mm. And uh, I would also say that uh, learning how to meditate on scripture is crucial. I spoke at a Christian camp, a reformed camp, a number of years ago. And uh, I decided in all every single weekday, I'd be speaking on how to meditate on scripture. And I said, how many of you people, of all the people stand, sitting out there, maybe 50 to 100 people, how many of you have ever heard a sermon on how to meditate on scripture? And only two hands went up out of 65 people. Wow. This was a reformed camp. And so uh, the Puritans used to say, Prayer begins with meditation and meditation ends with prayer. In other words, you can't really draw a hard and fast line between them. There's a seamless transition from one to the other. And uh, if you learn to meditate on scripture, the works and ways and wonders and will of God and preach that to yourself, you will erupt in spontaneous worship and prayer. Without going into a million different directions, um, what would you give us the best way, I guess, to meditate on scripture? I mean, it's it's not just it's not just reading it. You're saying what what do you mean by that? Well, for instance, um, let's say you're meditating on Colossians chapter three. 
practice occupying your mind on things above where Christ is seated in the heavenlies, you know, seated in the heavens at the right hand of the father. Uh, and stop putting all your focus on things on earth. You know, we're, we're commanded to occupy our minds on unseen things. That's not mm -hmm. easy. Right. In a, in a culture of stimuli, that's not easy. So when you're meditating, you're actually feeding your soul things that are nourishing to your soul. And so if you're meditating on Colossians 3, there's ample opportunity there to apply it to oneself. Um, put to death that which remains in your members of sin and glory in the fact that your life is hidden in Christ and you'll be revealed when he's revealed. And just... Feed your imagination. See, this is another aspect of, of meditation people don't even think about. They'll use their imagination when they have watched a movie or they try mm -hmm. to picture the superpowers of the Avengers or something else. But we want, we're supposed to use our imagination when we meditate. Mm -hmm. Lord, what could that mean? And I'll be revealed when you're revealed with me. Now, we're not talking about picturing what Jesus looks like. We're talking about letting your thought life address and inform your affections. So your affections begin to really savor these things. I, I really like what John Piper said, that uh, virtually all victory in spiritual warfare is the result of clear spiritual sight. Mm -hmm. And so meditation is for the purpose of sharpening our spiritual sight, uh, reviewing and consolidating our treasure, and then applying these truths to ourselves so that they transform us and the mind is renewed. And so if it says in Colossians three, that, uh, you know, let the peace of Christ umpire in your heart, arbitrate in your heart, you were called to this peace and be thankful. Mm -hmm. And it says you're a new man that is fashioned after the one who created him after the Lord himself. Uh, so many people are having a quiet time and they just brush up against scripture. They don't chew it. Yeah. As, as, as J.I. Packer said, the difference between the saved and the unsaved is like the difference between a clean and an unclean animal. <clears throat> the unclean animal didn't chew its cud, but the clean animal did. Mm -hmm. The believer chews truth. The unbeliever doesn't. He just brushes up against it. Mm -hmm. And so chewing the truth is <clears throat> applying it to yourself, preaching it to yourself, savoring it, demanding that you understand it. <clears throat> yeah, that's good. Uh, you mentioned one book a moment ago. I'll put that in the description. Um, is there another book that you would recommend for this particular meditating? I know, I know praying the Bible is one thing. I actually preached through that. I read that in seminary, a small book by Whitney, Don Whitney, um, and especially the Psalms and things and, and personal, basically kind of personalizing. These yeah, I'd recommend, I would recommend the uh, abridged book. Um, in John Owen's series, uh, one of the volumes is communion with God. And I okay. would highly recommend the, the unabridged one is, is very thick. It's close to 450 pages, but the abridged one is very readable in modern English communion with God, just a phenomenal book. Also, uh, the bruised read by Richard Sibbs is a terrific work. Um, I think the Character and Attributes of God is, is a wonderful book, but it's very long. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of shorter Puritan works that uh, are coming out as, as abridged titles now that are, that are really terrific as well. Yeah. No, that's good. Well, I'll put some of those uh, in the description for everybody. Um, do you have any final thoughts, Jay, you want to share with us? Yeah, I, I'm convinced that, uh, there is going to be a great falling away. I think when our Lord and the apostles described the last days, that uh, rather than it being characterized by great revival, it's going to be characterized by an apostasy, a great falling away. And I believe part of that of falling away is a lot of churches that have abandoned the transcendence of God. I, I, I encourage people to read anything that David Wells writes he talks a lot about recovering God's transcendence. And uh, David Wells warns that uh, if we keep 
um, bouncy and light evangelicalism and avoid the heavy things of God, we may wake up someday and find out we're worshiping ourselves and not the transcendent God of the universe. And so mm. um, no wow. place for truth, God in the wasteland, Christ in a postmodern world. There's so many excellent books by David Wells on this terrible drift away from transcendence. And so I'm doing a lot more writing in my own ministry now in uh, helping people understand what perseverance really is. Mm -hmm. we, think, we think of perseverance and uh, a, lot of, a lot of dear Christians, nothing really comes to mind other than just, well, I guess we have to hang in there. But uh, right. there's really a, a lot to it. And so uh, I, I'm in the process of starting a journal, a quarterly journal called the Journal of Persevering Grace. And uh, in, in some ways, I'm going to be using this journal, Lord willing, to help prepare people for the onslaught uh, that I believe is coming against Christianity in the Western world. Hmm. Okay. Well, um, where can people find you? Well, I have a website, uh, gospelforlife.org. That's G-O-S-P-E-L-F-O-R-L-I-F-E, -E, gospelforlife.org. Um, happy to communicate with you. Yeah. I'm also uh, an adjunct professor at Masters University. I've been teaching there for a decade and a half, and uh, really enjoy that. <clears throat> That's good. That's good. And you're not on social media, right? You're, a wi you're wiser than... <laughs> You're wiser than me. Okay. Uh, but yeah, no, connect. Yeah, connect with Jay if you want. Uh, Gospelforlife.org. It's good. And you've got, I've got a couple of your books. Um, do you have any books that you want to recommend? I know you just mentioned several, but anything that's that you would want someone to read that you've written? Well, I actually, uh, the latest books I've written, um, I was commissioned by the Homeschool Academy at Grace Community Church, where John MacArthur is pastor. Mm -hmm. I was commissioned there recently to uh, write their two-volume book on worldview. Oh, okay, and, nice. So it has 26 chapters. It's 13 chapters per volume. And I also illustrated it. And uh, really exciting to see that being used in that Homeschool Academy. And also some of the men I disciple who are pastors are using that in their men's study and also in their midweek apologetics studies as well nice that's right yeah i forgot to say that you're you're an artist we've got that that other thing in common as well with <laughs> okay. yes. not just worldview and other things but we both we both love aesthetics and art and nutrition actually i forgot yeah, all good well. all good yeah so it's you yeah what you eat matters so no that's good jay well i appreciate it brother thank you so much i hope this was helpful for everyone uh go ahead and check out jay's work at gospelforlife.org um, I'll put some of those books in the description uh, as well. Definitely the Puritans help us really kind of understand who God is, who we're worshiping. I really appreciate just kind of your thoughts as well and your experience there in the 60s and 70s, uh, kind of giving a real boots on the ground yes. view. I think that was really helpful. Um, and kind of the similarities and the differences uh, of what we have today and what we're up sure. against, as it were. So this was good, brother. I appreciate it. Um, absolutely yeah have a good night and uh, all right we'll see you later thanks Bye. richard god bless, bless.